Hello, everybody, and as a welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. So, obviously, this episode is going to be one of my book reviews, and the book in question is Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence by Kristen Godsey. And this is one that I had teased on Twitter and on Instagram when I actually got this book. And so many of you guys ask the obvious question, why in the hell would you torture yourself by reading this kind of book? And before we get into the book review, I do kind of want to address that question for a second, because outside of doing things specifically to make content, which that was obviously half the reason why I read this book, the other reason is that it is a good idea, I think, and I think there is a lot of value in reading things that you do not agree with. And not even just reading, but just consuming content in whatever way that you prefer to consume content. Whether you like to watch YouTube videos, or you listen to podcasts, or you read, or you listen to audiobooks, or however you like to consume your content. I think there is a lot of value in exposing yourself to content that you already know off the rip you're not going to agree with. Because it's all fine and good to stay in your own bubble and to consume the content that you know you're going to be nodding your head along with and being like, yes, yes, this is so correct. But there, there is a good, good amount of information to be had by exposing yourself to other ideas and to other concepts and even to the ones, like I said, that you know off the rip you're not going to agree with. Because it's it's valuable to know how the other half thinks. And so, obviously, there is nothing in this book that I agree with. But I still read it, and not just in the purpose of making this episode, but like I said, there there is value in seeing what other people's arguments are so that you can do a better job of steelmanning your own arguments, because now you know where they're coming from, and you know the arguments they're making. So then you can make your counter arguments before you even get in that situation where you have to do it on the fly. Like you already know what the arguments are, and you can already have sat down and thought about it and been mad at it and wanted to throw the book across the room or however you consume your content. Like I said, please do not throw any electronic devices across the room. I do not want to be responsible for you guys having to pay to replace those. But yeah, so I just wanted to go ahead and address that before we got into this book review. And I do encourage everybody, even if it's not reading something that is book length, because obviously that's a commitment. But I don't think it's too much of a commitment to go read like something from Jacobin or from whatever other ideologically opposite outlet of your personal beliefs. And I mean, even just like an article length piece or just like long form or like listen to podcasts of people that you know you disagree with, just because it it makes you a more well-rounded person. And like I said, it makes it easier for you to make your arguments for your beliefs when you know what the other side of the argument is. Now, having said all that, let's go ahead and get into the book review itself. First thing I want to address, if this sounds familiar, if the title, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, rings a bell in your head, there's a reason for that. This is the book-length version of Godsey's somewhat infamous 2017 New York Times op-ed by the same title. So, If you've read that op-ed, then you have an idea of what this book is going to be like. And this isn't like a doorstop by any stretch of the imagination, but this is an expanded version of that op-ed. And from what I can gather, that's kind of how this whole book deal came about, is she got it off of that piece, which I guess this is how you get book deals now. You just write really garbage takes for various outlets and somebody gives you a book deal. I need to learn how to write garbage takes for various outlets because I would like a book deal. But moving on from that, here, here's my, I'm going to go ahead and start with giving my kind of overarching 
issues with this book and then start going into specifics because it is laid out in various chapters. So my my biggest overarching criticism of this book, and this is one that you often see every time somebody espouses socialism or espouses communism, is they're starting from this idea that we live in a free market capitalist society, which we do not. I'm pretty sure that's not news to anybody listening to this, but we do not live under a laissez-faire free market capitalist environment. In fact, I could make the argument and I have made the argument in other venues that we live a hell of a lot closer to a socialist society than we do to a free market capitalist society. So the first thing off the rip is if you are criticizing capitalism or you're criticizing free markets and you're using our current system as your baseline for criticism, you're already starting from the wrong position because you're starting from a fallacy. We don't live in a free market. So first big overarching problem with this book. Second one is throughout the book, certain, I'm trying to figure out the best way to try to explain this. The work that first and second wave feminists put in and the advances that were made during first and second wave feminism, Godsey attributes not to the work of feminist or to society evolving, but she credits all of those accomplishments in direct relationship to them being things that happened because the U.S. was in competition with the Soviet Union. This is the first time I have ever heard that idea espoused anywhere at any time. So I just, I found that very weird and I found it very, very dismissive and actually very kind of offensive and just insulting to first and second wave feminists who did put in a lot of work to get women to where we are today in society and to just kind of minimize that as, oh, it's just, this is a thing that happened because the U.S. was in competition with the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was propping up women and making it look like they were a lot more involved in society. We'll get to that in a little while. But this idea that it was just completely reactionary to what was going on in the Soviet Union, I think it's just really, it, it really denigrates what was going on in this country. And it, it reduces, it, it reduces what first and second wave feminism did to like a, a geopolitical conflict. And yes, there were a lot of things that were happening in the U.S. during the Cold War that were a direct relationship and a direct kind of response to what was going on in the Soviet Union. I don't think this was one of them. So it was just a really, really weird stance to take for me. And I just, I didn't, I didn't like it. It rubbed me the wrong way. So anyway, let's go ahead and start moving into the chapters of the book. Now they're broken out into various kind of high level sort of ideas. And the first one is work. Now, Godsey uses to start off the chapter some of the most like i guess incendiary examples she can find of women being exploited under capitalism to try to make the argument that under socialism women had it better and that is another ongoing theme in this book and i'll try to touch on that in a couple of other different sections of this because it just seems to me like she wants to go to like the most inflammatory example of a thing that she can find in order to make her argument. And I'm just like, no, no, that's kind of not okay. And so we get into the work chapter. And one of the things in this book is the, the ideas that are in here to me not just on the topics of, you know, communism and socialism and stuff like that, but just the relationship of women to men are really, really insulting and really degrading. And the first one that pops up is that under capitalism, women have to subjugate themselves to men in order to survive. That 
somehow under capitalism, women cannot thrive on their own and that they have to have a man in their life. Like you have to latch on to a man. Like you got to get married. You got to find this dude who makes money and you got to do all this kind of stuff and you got to subjugate yourself to him in order to survive, which I'm sorry, but fuck you. No. Under capitalism, you have the ability as a woman to make your own life whatever it is you want it to be. And for what it's worth, women earn college degrees at a higher rate than men right now. They earn advanced college degrees higher than men right now. They are able to get into the workforce. You're able to make your own money. You're able to live as a single woman. And you don't need to latch on to a man. Like, this is not 1959. It's 2019. And that's that's kind of another thing that you often see when you see people espousing communism and socialism is they're going off this very outdated model of society that we just don't live in anymore. So, and this idea that that women fared better under socialism because they had these opportunities to go to work and make money and not have to marry a man or find a specific dude or anything like that is fucking bullshit. But on the topic of women in the workforce, yes, the Soviet Union highly encouraged women to enter the workforce. Now, Godsey likes to try to position this as the Soviet Union being this place where females and males were considered absolutely equal to each other. And so like this was some kind of female empowerment thing. It actually wasn't. What it was And you can draw a parallel to what the U.S. did during World War II with Rosie the Riveter, which is this idea of presenting women entering into the workforce and entering into what was normally considered, quote unquote, man's work. You know, doing factory work, doing physical labor, stuff like that, not like going and being a secretary or a receptionist or a stenographer or what would normally be considered women's work to get women to go into what would be normally considered men's work. It was presented as this female empowerment sort of thing. Like, you know, you you guys know Rosie the Riveter, you know, we can do it. What that actually was, and it was this way in the U.S. and in the Soviet Union, was a propaganda campaign because they needed warm bodies in the labor force. Like, this wasn't, a, a, this wasn't something where, like, the Soviet Union was trying to promote female emancipation through work. It was... They needed workers. So trying to dress this up as something other than that really just smacks of a certain kind of disingenuousness that it just like, I, I'm like, do you not see this? Like it was, it was not something that was like, it, it wasn't female empowerment. It was just, we need workers. Here are these women if we can dress this up in this certain way where, and again, I'll go back to Rosie the Riveter, where you can present it as as a woman, if you enter the workforce, you are helping your country. You're being very patriotic. You're being very nationalistic. You're, as, as far as the U.S. is concerned, you're, you're helping the war effort. As far as the Soviet Union is concerned, you're helping the motherland. Yeah, they just needed workers. This wasn't like some grand like female empowerment thing. But before we leave off of that chapter, there is another thing that she brought up that really kind of squicks me out every time I see it brought up, and it's the UBI argument. Now, I don't want to get into a huge discussion about how I feel about UBI in general. Maybe I'll make another episode on that in the future, but... I want to bring it up in this particular instance because as far as work is concerned, and I've seen this argument made through other venues, other people, and the idea of UBI being instituted in the United States as a way of paying mothers for staying home and taking care of their kids. Now, if you, as a woman decide that you want to stay home, you want to be a homemaker, you want to have babies, you want to take care of your kids, you talk it over with your significant other, this is what you guys want to do, this is what you you look at your finances, you say, okay, we can make this work, cool, do you, be the next Duger family, 
I don't care. Have all the babies you want. What bothers me as far as this particular argument and the UBI argument in this, in this sense of portraying it as a way of paying mothers for their labor, I'm not okay with the government putting their thumb on that scale of you deciding whether you stay at home or go to work. I'm not okay with the government being involved in that decision. I feel like that's a decision that every family should make. I feel like it's one that should be made freely and that there shouldn't be any kind of particular incentives one way or the other for a woman to either stay home or go to work. I feel like that should be an entirely personal, private decision between you and your significant other. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not... There's something about that that just really bothers me in a way that I can't quite put my finger on, but it just, it just, it creeps me out. Like, I'm just, I'm not okay with that argument. So, moving on to the next topic, which is motherhood. Now, for those of you who aren't super familiar with how things worked in the Soviet Union and other communist slash socialist countries, it was a very patriarchal society. And so there were obviously certain expectations put on women, even over and above, like, of course, you were expected to go to work, you were expected to have a job, but you were also expected to have children, preferably many children, uh, with certain, with certain notable exceptions, you were expected to have a family. So what ended up happening is this idea that men and women obviously were accepted as different. And that's another thing that I, I'm i very fascinated to see how intersectional feminism would deal with the realities of the Soviet Union, where it there was very much a gender differentiation. There, men were men, women were women, And while there was some kind of degree of equality, I guess, if you want to try to frame it in that way, as far as society was concerned, there was a distinct difference. And what was expected of women under the Soviet Union was that you would go to work and then you would also come home and you would still handle all of house and home. There was no division of labor in the household. And that was something that was baked into the cake, even going as far back as Marx, because he was asked about that, about, you know, what men should be doing in the house as far as division of labor. And his response was, that's women's work. And that was pretty much the attitude in the Soviet Union, was that child rearing was women's work, cooking, women's work, cleaning, women's work. Despite the fact that women were also in the workforce, they were working as many hours as men. They were still expected to come home and completely handle all of the home business. So I'm I'm sorry. What the, it, and that's that's the thing that kills me is like you you want to make these arguments that women had it so good under socialism and that there was just this all oh, this wonderful equality blah 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 blah. Societally speaking, no, there wasn't. There was none of that. There were definitely very strict gender ideas and rules and definitions and a very strict hierarchy of who does what and what is whose job. So, yeah. One way that they tried to square that circle is trying to do like state-funded maternity leave and daycare, which a lot of quasi-socialist countries try to do nowadays, although I I hesitate to even call them quasi-socialist. I mean, I'm talking about like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, all all of those sort of Scandinavian countries who get called socialist countries, but they're really not. So this was tried in the Soviet Union that women would have X amount of weeks of paid maternity leave, and then the state would provide daycare for the children. And again, this was not done in the idea of trying to make life easier for women. This was done in order to get women to go back to work. Like the whole idea behind 
behind actually like having paid maternity leave was to give a woman, I guess, a certain amount of time to, you know, you recuperate from childbirth. It's not like you just wake up the next morning and it's like, woohoo, yay, go back to work. But the idea behind state-sponsored childcare was that you would go back to work eventually. Once your maternity leave was over, you would not stay home and take care of your children. You would go back to work. And you're going to go back to work because we will take care of your child for you. So there's no reason for you to stay home. Which, again, goes back to my argument of I'm not okay with the state making these decisions for other people. But that's another one of those things that people like to dress up as, oh, look, the Soviet Union was just so pro-woman and they provided the state-sponsored child care. It's like, understand why they were doing it. It wasn't to emancipate women from the burdens of taking care of their children. It was so they would go the fuck back to work. Like, this is, and these are the kinds of things that people who espouse socialism and communism will deride in capitalism, but you don't want to see what that was under Soviet rule. Like, it's, it was the same thing. It was the same idea. So I just, I don't, I don't understand that. Another thing that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, which is women's abortion rights in the Soviet Union. Now, this did differ from Soviet state to Soviet state, and some states were more draconian than others. The, the worst, 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 worst case example was Romania under Ceausescu, where abortion was absolutely illegal. And it was to the point where the the Romanian government actually monitored women's menstrual cycles. Like they monitored your fucking cycle to make sure that you were having as many babies as humanly possible. Like there was an extreme amount of pressure put on women to have as many babies as possible in Romania. Now, other states handled it differently, but... Under Stalin, it, under Stalin, abortion was banned in 1936. It was made legal again in the 1950s. But there was a huge chunk of time where abortion was illegal under the Soviet Union. Now, this was not something that... It, it, it was. It, it's a weird thing when you read this book. And it's the idea that in the beginning, during the Bolshevik Revolution, during the Bolshevik Revolution, during the times of actual change, the idea of women's emancipation and of feminism as it was back then was embraced until it wasn't. And then we reverted back to this very, very strict patriarchal society. So, yeah, things weren't all that great for women during the vast majority of Soviet rule. So... Yeah, it it was just the the trying to dress things up as better than they were is kind of an ongoing theme in this book, and it really irritates the hell out of me. The next topic discussed in the book is leadership. And again, this is another area where Godsey wants to attribute the the Cold War competition between the US and the Soviet Union for gains made in the US for women. And Again, I I just like I've already said I don't I I think that's a really weird argument and I don't agree with it at all. But here's what the Soviet Union did to try to address gender imbalances in leadership. The first one is quotas. Now, obviously I have thoughts on quotas. I do not like them. I do not like the idea that somebody has their job or does not have their job based on their gender. I would never in a million years want to be put in that position of having to think to myself or to have other people around me think that the reason I have my job is because of my genitalia and not that I earned it and not that I deserved it and not that I competed on a level playing field and beat out everybody else. Like I just, I do not like quota systems. I think it's just, it's, it's ugly. It breeds resentment. It breeds just, uh, no, like just have the best people for the job. Like I don't, I don't give a shit. I don't care. They can be, you can be yellow with pink polka dots. I don't care. 
I, I, I don't understand quotas and I don't understand the purpose of them. I don't understand what it is people try to accomplish when they do these quota systems. But that is what the Soviet Union attempted to do to try to address gender equality inequalities in leadership. Now, even, even saying all that, there were women put into positions of titled power. Now, obviously, having a title doesn't mean shit unless you have the power that goes along with it. Soviet women did not have that. You had plenty of women in government. I mean, actually, you know what? I'll back it up. It wasn't even plenty. It was enough to be some decent window dressing. But these women were not given any kind of real seat at the table. They were not given any kind of real power. They were not part of any kind of decision making that was going on in the Soviet government that was completely handled by men. Completely. So, I mean, using women, using women as window dressing is not a cute look. It's not something to be, like, celebrated. These women were not we're not part of the day-to-day decision-making process. And for what it's worth, they were kept way, way, way far away from any kind of really high-level kind of government positions. So, no. They're, again, it was a very patriarchal society. And so, yeah, you, you had a couple women here and there. You had a couple women in, in the Portobello. You had a couple women in elected office. You had a couple of astronauts. Okay, cool. Whatever. It 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 made for it, it made for a pretty picture. Anyway, moving on to what is the general crux of this book and it got two chapters. Two chapters. And that's sex, obviously, by the title of the book. Now, this starts off with the part of the book that I find to be the most offensive part of this book. And to be perfectly honest, one of the most flat out fucking offensive things I think I've ever encountered in any of my readings anywhere. And that is the idea of sexual economic theory. To break it down into a smaller digestible chunk, the idea of sexual economic theory as put forth in this book is the idea that women don't ever have sex with men just because they want to have sex with men. There's always another angle. There's always an ulterior motive. You're either trying to, I guess, trick a man, for lack of a better word, into loving you or taking care of you or giving you money or in some way benefiting you in ways other than just having sex with a man. You can see where this is really fucking offensive, right? Like, you, uh, great, fantastic. You just made the argument that every MGTOW and incel makes about women. Thanks, Kristen. That's exactly what we needed in this world. Is somebody espousing the idea that every time a woman has sex with a man, there's some kind of angle. There's there's some kind of, of really gross thing going on. And as an example, she uses a married couple that she knows. And apparently, I guess the woman stays home and the man goes out to work. And so her and her married woman friend are trying to go out to just get some drinks and do whatever. And so married woman friend is having to have this fight with her husband about getting the credit card to go out to go have the go have the drinks and she makes the comment married woman friend makes the comment that whatever it's it's fine i'll just have sex with him later and i'm like what the fuck are you kidding me like okay I'm sorry that your friends have some kind of weird ass sexual dynamic going on in their life but the rest of us don't operate that way so That kind of underpins this whole idea of women having better sex under socialism is the very gross, grimy, disgusting idea that under capitalism, 
women only have sex with men to get something from them. No. Bye. Uh Uh-uh. Like, no. Thanks for erasing all of our fucking agency. Like, I'm just, I'm still blown away by this concept. Like, I'm just, oh my god, that's just so, uh, so gross. So, such, such a fucking gross way of looking at sex. But, like I said, that's the underpinnings of this whole idea of women having better sex under socialism, is that under socialism, as a woman, you don't have to do these sorts of things because you can have your own money and your own stuff and your own house and your own this, that, and the other. And I'm just like, you can have that under capitalism too, you know? Like, women aren't fucking slaves under capitalism. Where the hell did anybody get this fucking idea? Like, it just, oh my God, it's so offensive. So, so fucking offensive. And again, it's another one of these where you look at it and you're like, what decade are you looking at? Are you looking at the one that we currently live in? Like, what the fuck? But yes, that's that's the idea. But moving back to how sex was during the, the Soviet Union and, and under Soviet rule, there was originally, in the beginning, after the Bolshevik Revolution, there was a certain period of time where women's sexual liberation was a thing. Like, you you were liberated as a woman, but then after, I don't even think it made it 10 years. That shit got locked down quick. And what ended up happening is, again, we went back to this very patriarchal society, and birth control started getting incredibly scarce. Abortion was illegal for quite some time. And so you were, you were back to square one. You were back to this, this idea that, I mean, you, you could have sex, but if you got pregnant, then you got pregnant and then you had to have the baby because you, birth control was practically fucking non-existent because the central planners, of course, being men, never really stopped to think about what would make a woman's life easier. So yeah, birth control, bye. Feminine hygiene products, bye. Washing machines, bye. Like, the central planners didn't give a fuck about women under socialism. Let's keep it real. So this whole idea that women had better sex under socialism, I don't know. Maybe they had more orgasms? I don't know. And she cites some examples from comparing East Germany and West Germany. And as far as who had more and better orgasms. Now, I am always a little suspicious of self-reported sex surveys, especially when one side of the equation is trained to make things sound a little more rosy than they actually were. But even under normal circumstances, like, I don't, I, I don't thoroughly trust anybody to be completely honest about how many orgasms they're having during sex under any circumstances in any self-reported sex survey. But even if that were the case, even if it, if it even if it was a two to one difference, if women under socialism were having twice as many orgasms as women under capitalism, that still would not be enough for me to deal with all the other bullshit and all the other indignities and all of the other things that I would have to deal with as a woman under socialism. Like that is not a payoff for me. That's not enough. Like having to stand in line for bread that I don't get and to have to live in housing that is crumbling around me. And by the way, I may come home one day and all of a sudden my living room is somebody else's fucking apartment and the roads are shit and we got rolling blackouts and we've got rolling water outages. And like, this is not, orgasms are not going to be enough to make me happy. And, and there was, and there's a point in this book where the argument is made, and I forget which country, because each country did handle things a little differently. Each country did have its own societal norms that even going into being part of the Soviet Union, each country was a little different. But uh, there was one country, I want to say, I want to say it was East Germany, that basically espoused the idea that, well, everything else is shit, so might as well fuck. And I'm like, that's not, 
that's not a good solution to your problems. Like, it, it's a fine temporary solution, don't get me wrong. But that's not going to make me, like, forget the fact that I have no food. I'm hungry, and I, my house is falling apart, and I have no electricity. And everything is just kind of shitty and sucky and gray and horrible. Like, there's not enough orgasms to make me forget that. There just isn't. And another thing that gets brought up, especially in the East Germany, West Germany comparison, is that under socialism, there was more sex education, which I will give them props for that. I feel like we need to have more sex education everywhere, especially in regards to the female body and kind of how things work and where all the parts are and you can locate them and you know what they do. Okay, but again, that's not going to be enough to make up for all the other bullshit I'd have to deal with living under socialism. Like, okay, great. A guy knows how to make me come. It's 1985 and I'm using a menstrual rag. Like, come on now. That's not going to be enough to fix that situation. So, moving on from sex to the last portion of the book, and that is citizenship. Now, when this, t when, <laughs> this is such a weird chapter, honestly, because this, it doesn't really focus on citizenship in the Soviet Union, as far as women are concerned. It focuses on citizenship in the U.S. today, as far as women are concerned, and she goes for the obvious, again, most extreme example, and that is of these fucking dipshits who want to deprive women of the right to vote to repeal the 19th Amendment. Um, no. I'm sorry, no. You don't get to use some, like, stupid fringe argument to try to try to say that, like, this is a mainstream idea. No, it's not. There's, there's, there's nobody in the mainstream who's looking to disenfranchise women. I'm sorry. There just isn't. As much as you may want to squint and tilt your head and look at 8chan, it's just, that's not real life. So, anyway, moving past that in that particular chapter is the, the lecture of how women need to vote in their best self-interest. Now, I have discussed this in past episodes, in other contexts, and I'm sorry, who the fuck are you to tell any woman what her best interest is and how she should be voting? You don't know her. You don't know what her interests are, let alone her best self-interest. You automatically assume that a woman's best self-interest is to have the state take care of her. That ain't my best self-interest. You will never catch my ass voting for that. So... Again, it's just, it's this very preachy tone that women have to deal with nowadays from other women. It's just like, no, you don't get to make that choice for somebody else. You don't get to tell another woman like, oh, well, you should vote for blah, 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 because it's in your best self-interest. You don't know me. You don't know any other woman. The only woman you know is yourself. So you do whatever you want to do, but don't think that all of us want to be dependent on the state and all of us want to live under some bullshit socialist utopia that has never existed and certainly has never existed for women. Let's get that straight. It has never existed for women. So, no. And... So, on that note, that is pretty much where the book ends. Like, there's suggested reading material after that, which I, you can go do whatever the hell you want to do. But my overall... I, <laughs> do I even have to give my overall impression of the book at this point? I think I've pretty much discussed that. But one thing that I meant to mention in the beginning, and I didn't, and I do want to make sure I mention it in this review because it is something that annoyed the living hell out of me. And that is that at so many points in this book, Godsey had to back up and acknowledge the fact that reality did not match up with her ideas. Like, when you're saying that women did this, that, or the other, but then you have to, like admit that reality comes into play and in saying like even even using the example of women in government in the Soviet Union 
having to admit that those women really welded no power whatsoever or admitting through like through the work chapter that women were put into the workforce because they needed labor not that it was some kind of like emancipation thing and that daycare was provided by the state to women to make them go back to work like having to acknowledge the reality of the situations of what you're speaking of and how they don't line up with what you're saying like at some point do you not stop to think that you're being intellectually dishonest and that maybe the the points that you're trying to make don't line up with reality to the point where you have to keep pointing out how they don't line up with what the actual lived reality of women under Soviet Union rule was? Like, I, 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 what? And I, I get it. I, I mean, you got a book deal. You got to write words. You got to put them on a page. You got to send them off to your editor. Okay, whatever. But, at, I mean, at some point you have to admit when you're being intellectually dishonest. And I think that's my biggest problem with this book, is that for all of the all of the rhetorical feints and all of the ways of trying to parse it in a certain way, it's not the reality of the lived experiences of women in the Soviet Union. And it's not like... This is some kind of academic navel-gazing thing where we have to wonder what life would be like for women under socialism. There's plenty of literature out there now. Plenty of it. You you can read first-person accounts of what women went through under socialism, under Soviet rule. Like, you, you don't have to wonder. You can know. Anybody can know. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this book review up with a recommendation for another book that I think is way better if you want to have an idea of how women actually lived under communism. And that is another one that I have done a book review for, and that is How We Survived Communism and Even Laughed by Slavenka Jokulik. That is such a great book. I highly recommend everybody read that. You can read this book if you want. You can read God Sees Book. I mean, I like I said, I still think there is value in reading things that you disagree with, just so you can know kind of where the other half is coming from. So, yeah. Would I recommend it? I mean, on that level, sure. But anything else, I mean, that's, it's up to you. It's entirely up to you what you want to do. So, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up on that note. If you did make it this far, thank you as always. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care, and until next time.